We're just going to sing because the Holy Ghost is here. And what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be I love this verse here listen now there'll be no sorrow there no more sorrows now no more burdens to bear no more sickness no pain and no more parting over there. Sing it. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day. That will be now lifted up and let all our brother hear you now. And what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Looking forward to that day, say amen. It's preaching time. I said it's preaching time. Why don't you just stay standing? You might as well grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians tonight. Philippians chapter number one. Philippians chapter number <clears throat> one. Thank you, Allens, for singing tonight with God on you. Thank you, Browders, for singing tonight with God on you. Anointing makes all the difference. And I appreciate you making it ready for me to be able to preach. If you can't preach after that singing, you ain't God called. That's exactly right. Amen. If you're there in Philippians, say amen. amen. Philippians 1 and verse number 4. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making request with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the day until now, here's my text, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'll say that again. Being confident, Matt, of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you not may perform it. If your Bible says that, you got the wrong Bible. Didn't say could perform it. That's, that's the wrong, now that ain't right. It says we'll perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The message tonight is this, God's gonna finish what he started. God is gonna finish what he started. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Father, for just a little bit, you'd empty me of myself. God, you'd fill me with the Holy Ghost of God. Thank you for the sweet presence under the tent tonight. 
Thank you for the anointed singing. Thank you for the testimony from Brother Josh. And God, thank you, Lord, for setting it up so I can preach tonight. God, help us, Lord, to just uh, pull up to the table and eat some fresh bread out of the oven of heaven. God, I pray for every individual here tonight. May we be encouraged in the word. And God, for all the hundreds that are watching online tonight, God, may you speak to every heart. For that person that's in a dark place tonight, God, may you encourage their heart. God, for that saint that's kind of discouraged and depressed tonight, God, may you encourage them tonight. And God, for that sinner that's nearest the flames of hell, I pray, God, the convicting power of God would sweep through their heart, show them their need of a Savior. And God, may they bow before a thrice holy God and get birth into the family of God. Now, God, help us tonight and preach this, Lord, as if it's our final time. And God, if it is our final time, I pray, Heavenly Father, you'd save the soul that's nearest hell. And God will give you all the praise, honor, and glory. For it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. And all God's people said, I feel some preaching coming on right now, I'm just telling you. We find our text landing tonight in the book of Philippians chapter number one which is one of my favorite verses in verse number six where the Bible says that being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. How many is thankful for that verse tonight? I'm thankful that just four years ago God started a work in me and he promised me he's going to perform Form it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you're sitting here and you've been birthed into the family of God, that day that Jesus came by your way and convicted you of your sins and transformed your heart and took all of that sin away, washed your heart in the blood of Jesus, he started a work in you and he's going to perform it and it doesn't matter how many demons of hell try to stop it, it doesn't matter how much the devil tries to stop it because God's word is forever settled in heaven if God said it, that settles it, honey, and you can take it to the bank. How many of y'all are thankful that God started a work in you when God saved you? I think about my own life. Whenever everybody had walked out on me, brother, Jesus came walking in, and he had a blueprint for my life. It didn't match everybody else's blueprint, but it was God's blueprint. And when he came in on the scene, Doug, he said, this is what I have for your life, boy. And there ain't enough brethren going to stop it. There ain't enough demons going to stop it. Stop it. There ain't enough devils gonna stop it because when I start, honey, I'm gonna finish it. I'm thankful that four weeks ago God sent this gospel tent to Roberta, Georgia, and He said, When everybody says that it can't be done, honey, I've got a plan and I'm gonna start something and I ain't stopping till I finish it. How many is thankful that when God starts something, He's gonna finish it? I said, How many is thankful that when God He starts something? Hallelujah it to God. He's going to finish it. There ain't enough Baptists to stop it. They, hey, you better help me preach now. There ain't enough Methodists to stop it. There ain't enough Republicans to stop it. Because when God says it, bless God, he is going to finish it tonight. God finished what he started when he created the earth. At creation, he finished what he started. Now let's think about God for a little bit. Here's God. In the beginning, it was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And all three of them was happy within themselves. But he had a plan. He started creating the heaven and the earth. He started creating the light and the stars and the moons. He started creating all the grass and all the animals. And he didn't just poof and make it all happen but he meticulously crafted every little detail every detail about creation God had it thought out in his head and he meticulously crafted every little detail of creation but it wasn't just in creation that he meticulously crafted everything but he majestically choreographed everything he had a plan and it was in order and as he was speaking light into existence as he was breathing life into the 
the nostrils of mankind. Everything was majestically choreographed. But not just that, honey. It was marvelously controlled. Everything God did, he was controlling every aspect of that. Imagine the God that created the heavens and the earth. He's in control of your life tonight. It may seem like you're in turmoil. It may seem like there's a dead end street everywhere you turn. It may seem like that every step you take forward, you take 500 back. But you can say, rest assured, honey, that the God that spoke light into existence is the same God that's controlling your life. He's the same God that says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. He's the same God that said, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Hallelujah. We got a God that's marvelously controlling everything tonight. He's controlling your life. He's controlling my life. He's controlling this crusade. And he's going to finish what he started. Hallelujah. Not only did he meticulously craft creation, but he majestically choreographed creation. He marvelously controlled creation, but he also miraculously completed creation. So my wife's an artist. She's one of the most phenomenal painters you'll ever meet. Not many people know that about her. She don't like to talk about it. But she can paint anything from her imagination. Some of the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen is hanging in our home back in Tennessee. But when she first takes out a canvas, she goes off into the art room and she starts putting something together. That first little bit, man, it don't look like much. I mean, it looks rough. There's paint splattered everywhere. There's paint all over the floor. There's paint all over her hands. She's got her hair pulled out because she's aggravated with it, something that's going on with the painting. And when I walk in and look at it, I think, dear God, what is she trying to paint? <laughs> but that's just like God and us. Yeah. See, to everybody around us, they look at me and you, Chet, and they say, boy, that boy's a mess. He was just a drug addict. He was just an old dope head. He was just an old alcoholic. Don't you know his wife was a stripper? She made a whole lot of money taking her clothes off. They're just a mess. But to God, he says, I never leave a painting unfinished. It may look like a mess to you, and it may look like a mess to you, but to God, he sees the end picture. And I'm thankful that God sees the beginning. God sees in between, and God sees the end. Hallelujah and he ain't finished with me yet. I mean, he's thankful that God's not finished with you yet. Hey, help me here. I mean, he's thankful that what God starts, he's gonna finish in your life. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean God's not doing it. I'll say that again because that went over some of your head. Just because you can't see it with your physical eyes doesn't mean God ain't working behind the scenes. You see, sometimes he has to stop and change brushes. See, you can't paint a whole picture with the same brush. Sometimes you have to change midstream and here, here's how it goes. That guy on TV, I can't think of his name, but everybody used to watch him. He's dead now. He used to take something, create something. All of a sudden, halfway, with Bob Ross, that's what his name was, and ha halfway between the painting, he'd say this. Let's just, I wasn't gonna do this, but let's, let's put a little bird right here. Uh, you know, a little old tree will look good right here. Uh, I think some water right here will look just good. See, he didn't go in there saying it's gonna be this way and this way only, but midstream he added some things to it and he took some things away from it and that's what God does in our life. We may have a plan for our life. We may have it all choreographed in our mind. We may say, Matt, this is how my life's gonna be. This is how I dreamed it to be. This is how I planned it to be and then along the way when things don't go our way, we get discouraged. We get depressed. We're ready to throw in the towel on God, but God's still controlling the paintbrush and he's just 
just saying, no, it may not be exactly the way you wanted it, honey, but I'm adding a little tree here. I'm adding a little bush here. I'm adding a little eagle here. I'm adding a little water here. And when I'm done, honey, it's going to be the portrait that I wanted it to be. I'm thankful my life is in the hands of God. I said I'm thankful that my life is in the hands of God. He's controlling my life and he's controlling you tonight. God's going to finish what he started. Chet Cooper, he sent you here 17 years ago. We've talked. A lot of times, you said there's some times I just wanted to pack up and head on out. I understand that. But God's not finished what he started yet. He may change brushes on you. The portrait may not be as pretty as what you thought it'd be. But he's going to finish what he started, Matt. We talked about last night. Some things taking a little different direction with y'all. You may not have foresaw that. But God says, hey, I got a new brush here. I'm going to paint some more stuff on your portrait. I'm going to guide you this way just a little bit. I'm going to steer you this way just a little bit. Last year at this time, we were planning to take the tent to Los Angeles around this time. I was supposed to be in Los Angeles just a couple of blocks from where Billy Graham set up his tent in 1949. I was supposed to be there right now. But you know what? That wasn't on my schedule to be in Roberta, but it was on God's schedule. And God said, I don't want you to be in Los Angeles right now. I'll send you to Los Angeles when I'm ready for you to be there. But there's a little bitty town that nobody's ever heard of hardly in Georgia in central Georgia where it's hot, where it's humid, where it feels like you're at the flames of hell but I'm going to send that gospel tent down there and I'm going to set it up beside an old Methodist church with a graveyard in the back right in the middle of town and I'm going to give them a chance to see my presence and to feel my presence and to have me answer their prayer. Why? Because God, he holds the paintbrush in his hand and he says I am going to finish what I started so he he did all this at creation but it ain't just that he did it at Calvary too see he meticulously crafted the whole thing see the devil thought he controlled it all but all of this was crafted in God's foreknowledge before the beginning of time don't let that scare you. God's a sovereign God. Before the beginning of time, he had all of this crafted out. He had every detail. He knew the exact moment that Jesus would be born. He knew the exact moment that Jesus would die on the cross. And guess what? He'd already planned for Jesus to get up out of that grave three days later. But there had to be a process. The painting had to be painted. There had to be pieces of the painting that added to it day after day. And for 33 years, Jesus walked the earth and every day that went by there was another paintbrush going on the canvas there was another part of that painting being done there was another part of that painting being crafted there was another part of that painting being majestically choreographed there was another part of that painting being marvelously controlled there was another part of that painting being meticulously crafted all along the way but then on that third day we see when the devil thought he controlled everything he thought he controlled the narrative he thought he had Jesus in the palm of his hand then God woke up and said hey 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 boy I'm still I'm going to miraculously complete this whole thing honey because my painting ain't done yet it wasn't enough for Jesus to die it wasn't enough for him to come and just die on the cross honey there had to be a resurrection and on that third day up from the grave he arose up from the grave he arose glory glory to his name tonight God finished what he started at creation. He finished what he started at Calvary. But he's been painting a picture for over 2,000 years that ain't finished yet. We're still in the God working on this painting part, mother. You say, what what are you talking about? He's not come again yet. But he's going to come again. And when he comes again, he's going to finish what he started. See, for 2,000 years since Acts chapter number 1, we've been looking up for Jesus to return. A 1,000 years went by, he never showed up. 1,500 years have gone by, he ain't showed up yet. 2,000 years have now gone by, he still ain't back. But here we got something 
that we can go by that gives us an insight on when the Lord's coming back. And it's 66 books of God-breathed, inspired words. And if you are any bit of a Bible scholar at all, you know that there's nothing in this word that is left to be undone, that has to be done before the Lord comes back. Jesus returning, I believe, is the next thing on God's prophetic calendar. Now, if you're not saved, this makes you extremely nervous. But for me, it makes me excited because I know the final portrait that God is painting is about to be completed on mankind. It's about to be completed for the birth, before the kid, for the children of God that's been birthed in the family of God. He's been painting this brush for 2,000 years. He's been painting this painting for 2,000 years. And one day soon, that trumpet's going to sound. He's going to split the eastern sky. And we're going to get up and get out of here. And that painting's going to be complete. And we're forever. Oh, God. We're forever ever, ever going to be with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you're excited tonight for Jesus coming back, stand up and give him some glory in this place. Here's one thing I do know. If God started it, He's going to finish it. You see a whole lot of people that's in one minute, out a second, they're doing something for God, quote unquote, one minute. And the next minute they're out. One minute they're doing this up and down, in and out. See, God don't work like that. When God starts something, He's going to finish it. And there ain't enough demons in hell that can stop it. Mark it down, Larry. When God does something, he's going to finish it. Now, let me give you an example. God saved me four years ago off a bar stool. It's no secret what I was. It's all over the internet. I preach it everywhere I go, and it's in a book that's been sold all over the world. My story is transparent. I hold nothing back. My wife and I have told everything that God saved us out of. As embarrassing as it is sometimes. Last year, God had this tent in East Tennessee. We started in June. I had preached the first six months of last year. I preached a lot of churches in the East Tennessee area. I got called to preach at a faith home mission church. A faith assembly, I believe is what it was called. It's a Church of God church in East Tennessee. Never been there, didn't know the pastor. He'd come to a meeting I had preached the year before. He called an individual that knew me and said, can you get a hold of Brother DR and see if he'd come to our little church? So this individual called me and said, would you come? I said, well, I have nothing available but February the 15th. It was a Saturday night. She called me back and she said, he said he'll take it. So I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if it was a storefront building. I didn't know if it was a house. I didn't know what it was. I just knew that God gave me the green light to go. We pull in off of the highway. It's a four-lane road. We pull in off the highway, and as soon as we get to the driveway, the cars are backed up trying to get in. They ran out of room to park people. I got in that church and it was standing room only. They were standing in the lobby. They were in the choir. They were up and down the sides. Every chair they had was out. It was a building seats 150 people. There's 400 people in there. There was 40 some churches present, preachers and pastors. I thought, well, I don't know what God's trying to do, but He's definitely here tonight. I got up and preached, and 42 people got saved that night. The pastor said. Can you come back Monday? I said, I'll have to pray about it. I prayed and the Lord said, you need to go. So I had to move meetings around. I went back and stayed for two weeks. And over those two weeks, 110 people trusted Christ. And the revival fire started burning in that area. 
That pastor got my number and about a week or two later he called me and he said, DR, there is a local pastor at the First United Methodist Church of Rogersville that wants you to come to their church and preach. I thought, dear God, Methodist Church. At this time, this has been the first one I'd been in. I said, uh, are you sure he really wants that? He said, yes, he wants you to come. We walked in that Methodist church that night, and it was a big church, had a balcony in it, and the church was packed full. And all the choir members of the Methodist church were sitting in the choir. Most of them were elderly. And they sang before I preached. But up in front of the pulpit was a communion table, and they had all their candles lit in front of the pulpit. I thought, this ain't good. Me and candles and fire, I, this ain't good. I'm going to preach hard. I'm going to knock it over. I'm going to burn the whole church down. But God showed up in that service. And the first person to get saved that night, I think there was 20-some saved, the first person to get saved that night was an 87-year-old lady that was singing in the choir that had been a member of that Methodist church most of her life. So I had plans to go somewhere else. I already had plans to do something different. Do something different. You know, DR's plan. DR's portrait. I'm, I'm trying to paint my own plan. You know what I mean? Like most of us do, we try to direct our own paths and we end up messing up everything. So all these pastors that night put me on the spot. My dad was one of them. They all got together in a circle and said, I don't know what they're talking about. I found out afterwards. And then they got up in front of everybody and said, Brother DR, would you mind bringing the tent to our town? My dad looked at me and said, Son, you probably ought to bring that tent here. And immediately the Lord spoke to me and said, I want your tent to come to this town. And I want it this year. So from that moment to July to June, all the work was done. Everything was just in fast-paced motion trying to get everything done. And we started the Rogersville Awakening, East Tennessee Awakening in June. From the first night, the Holy Spirit was there. Many were getting saved, and we made it to week number 10. I had already been sick with 103 fever. It was so hot under that tent. But I kept preaching because I knew there were people who were waiting in the balance. That night, it was a Tuesday. I got up. I don't remember much. Everything I've just told you is in a book that they made for me. That's the only way I can even tell this story because what happened next erased all my memory of that whole meeting and what was done. I started to preach, and the only thing I remember after that was spinning in circles like this. And I did it two or three times and that's the last I remember. At that moment, I hit the stage totally out, passed out while I was preaching. I hit the stage right here. There was a paramedic sitting over there where Matt's sitting at about that area. He'd been coming about every night. He rushed to the stage and people got around me and he told me that I quit breathing for over a minute. I had bit my tongue because I started having seizures. I was foaming at the mouth, shaking all over. I had just had a heat stroke that had triggered seizures. What I'm saying is this wasn't on my portrait, but it was on God's portrait. It, it was His plan. They called the ambulance. They rushed me to the hospital. By that paramedic's testimony, I came conscious in the ambulance and I started witnessing to the other paramedic. And come to find out that paramedic had been out of church most of his life. And that paramedic told me, the one that revived me, said, DR, you asked him if he went to church and if he was saved. And all he did was just bow his head and say, no, I'm not saved. On the way to the hospital, I woke up in the emergency room again. And they were doing all these tests. They said, we're going to discharge you. I felt so bad. Something just didn't feel right. I went to stand up, I passed out again, had another seizure. That moment they put me in ICU, started running tests. The next day they hooked me up to a machine that stuck all these wires in your head and all this stuff and doing brain tests, checking me for cancer and brain tumors and checking my heart and all this stuff. They said they don't put me on seizure medicine. 
So they put me on 2,000 milligrams of the strongest seizure medicine that you can take. And the top milligram they normally give people is 500 a day. They gave me 2,000 milligrams immediately. All I know was, brother, when I started taking that pill for the first day, something wasn't right. They sent me home after three days, and I'd wake up at night, and I can't even, you believe it, don't believe it, doesn't matter. I could literally see the demons of hell when I would wake up. I could see the demonic forces of hell, and Chet, they were laughing at me. Every time I'd get up, ask my wife, I'd get up, I'd be sweating, I'd be panicking, I'd get up and I'd jump and I'd start walking around the room trying to get rid of them. And I'd finally lay back down, I'd say, God, you gotta help me, something ain't right. I ain't supposed to be on this medicine, something don't feel right. But they kept saying, take that medicine, take that medicine. After about a week of taking that medicine, mother, I couldn't take it no more. I believe with all my heart the devil was trying to kill me. He's trying to make me lose my mind. Finally, I told Laura, I said, I'm getting off this medicine. I'd rather have seizures the rest of my life than be taking these pills. I started weaning myself off the pill. And then God sent a lady by my way, said, I have a doctor by the name of Dr. Ward in Johnson City, Tennessee. He's a Christian doctor. And he personally wants to look at you because he thinks he can help you. I said, well, I don't know. The last people I just went to didn't seem to want to help me. I hope he does. I said, I'll give it a shot. We went to that doctor's office and we walked in. And the first song playing over the intercom when we walked in is, he's a way maker. You see, God was painting a portrait. We walked in that room and Dr. Ward said, hey, my name's Dr. Ward and I hear you're DR. I've heard a lot of stuff about you and I've looked you up online and you've blessed my heart. And he said, son, before I ever do anything for you, I want to pray over you. And I want you to know that God's got this in control. And he said these words. He said, boy, he said, God's not through with you yet. And he laid his little hands. He's 71 years old. He laid his little hands over top of my head. And he said, dear God, he said, this is your man. And he said, I know with all my heart that I can help him because you told me I could. And he said, this boy's got a big purpose that you put him on this planet for. And you ain't done with him yet. And all I know is over the next four months, that doctor, I saw him two, three, four days a week. He hooked me up to machines. He started doing all this stuff. And he said, he come in there one day, he said, I know what your problem is. He said, you got a brain parasite. I said, that sounds bad. He said, it is bad. He said, it's a wonder you're still with us. And he said, it's not only in your brain, but it's made it through your bloodstream and now it's eating at the outer walls of your heart. I said, well, doc, I said, am I going to live much longer? He said, oh yeah, we got it all figured out how God's going to fix this. He started putting on pills. He started putting on medicine. He started doing all these therapeutic things and doing all this stuff and raising your arm and checking all your all this stuff. I mean, just everything. And day after day, I started getting a little bit better day after day. Day after day, day after day. Then after a week or two, he'd run tests. He said, boy, you're, you've improved 40%. Your brain's improved 60%. Your heart's improved 80%. Your heart's improved 90% till he said, son, you're 100% better with that brain. That parasite's gone, and now it's getting going on your heart. And all those months I sat there, and it was in those dark times, God revealed treasures to me. He revealed his presence to me. He revealed his plan for me. And he said, boy, I started something in your life and I ain't finished with it yet. I said all that to say this. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how bad it is. If God started it, bless God, he's gonna finish it. It may not look like what you wanted, but thanks be to God, you can know that God is in control of your life. God's gonna finish what he started. If you'd have told me four years ago I'd be under a tent preaching, I'd have laughed you out of the bar. I would. I would have literally laughed you out of the bar. If somebody told me I'd be on the stage preaching with the browder singing, I'd have been like, you're crazy. I ain't got no time for them. They sing southern gospel music. If you told me I'd be hanging out with the Allens, 
Todd, I wouldn't have had nothing to do with y'all four years ago. But God was painting a picture even in my darkest hour, even sitting on that bar stool, even smoking that dope, even playing that rock and roll music. God was painting a picture and I didn't even know it. And then all of a sudden on May the 20th, he says, I'm going to pull out a different brush, boy. This brush has the blood of my darling son on it. And I'm going to paint it on your heart. And I'm going to take all that black sin. I'm going to wash it all away. You see, that was wasn't on my plan. Hallelujah. But that was on God's plan. And he took this heart. He washed it in the blood of Jesus. And I came out whiter than snow. Do you know that every person under here is God's masterpiece? This is good. God just said this to me, and I'm going to tell y'all. You're portrait number one of one in God's eyes. You're not a print off of another version. You're not a print off of the original. But every person under here is only one of one in God's eyes. And when he takes his brush and he paints your life, he looks at every meticulous detail of your life because you're number one in his eyes. Just like I'm number one in his eyes. And he loves me just as much as he loves you. And he loves you just as much as he loves me. And he's going to do everything he can to make sure he fulfills his will in your life. And he ain't going to leave out no details. He ain't going to leave nothing off. And when it's done, he's going and take you and hang you up on the wall so everybody can see what kind of painting you are and how proud he is of you. Somebody needs to wake up in this place and understand that what God starts, hallelujah, he's gonna finish. Now, let's bring it home because I'm tired. We use this verse all the time. Sometimes it's taken out of context. Sometimes when you use it on people, you almost, they want to slap you because it's not the time and place for it, but here it applies. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to His purpose. There's a lot of things in my life, Matt, I don't understand. I don't understand that my wife and I lost three children. I don't understand that. But here's what I prayed. After I got saved and she got pregnant the first time, I said, God, if this child's going to grow up to be a dope head or a drunk like I was, don't let it be born. And he answered my prayer. When she got pregnant with twins, I prayed the same prayer. God, if these twins don't grow up and they ain't going to serve you and they're going to be drunks and dope heads and alcoholics and die and go to hell, God, don't let them be born. And he answered my prayer. That wasn't on my plan, but that was on God's plan. We've never been able to have another child but Kylie. And she's one special person. Yeah. Matt, you wasn't here. A couple of months ago, Kylie started sleeping to one and two o'clock in the day, every day. It wasn't like her. And uh, me and Laura started talking and I started getting worried she had something going on. She's sick. And we was actually talking about taking her to the doctor just to have her checked out. We wasn't going to say nothing to her. We were just going to say, Let's, we're going to take you to the doctor just to make sure everything's going on. Okay. Then all of a sudden she came in there one day and she had her little laptop. Now she's 10 years old now. She had her little laptop. She came in there and said, Hey, Mama. I said, I want to I show you something. She said, I know I've been sleeping late, but I've been staying up every morning for the last few weeks, every night, to about 4 a.m., working on something. Her mama said, What have you been working on? She said, I've been writing a book. Her mama said, You've been writing a book about what? She said, well, I really felt led of the Lord to tell all the kids in America of what my life was like before you and Daddy got saved and now what it's like after y'all got saved. 
And she titled that book, From a Nobody to a Somebody. And I started reading that book, and tears just started coming out of my eyes. And she, in her words, was telling everybody what her life was like with a drunk daddy. But then what it was like after God saved her daddy. And all I could think was, God's going to finish what He started. And God has a meticulous plan. And God's plan included that little 10-year-old little girl because He knew that 10-year-old little girl. And I believe with all my heart, and nobody can tell me no different, when I was drunk on a bar stool and her mama was in a strip club, that little girl was going with my sister every Sunday or every other Sunday to the church, and she'd crawl up in the altar. And I know that people say, well, she's too young. No, I believe God heard that prayer. I believe God heard her prayer because all she knew was is that there was a bigger plan for her life and a bigger plan for her daddy mama's life than what she was living in. She knew there was more to life than just an alcohol bottle. She knew there was more to life than just a joint. She knew there was more to life than just fussing and cussing. What are you saying? I'm saying God started something and he is going to finish it. So what's going on in your life where you think God's through with you? If God can use somebody like me, God can use anybody. I don't care what you've done. I won't say this here, that way I get both sides. You may have never done anything like we did. You may have grown up in a Christian home your whole life and never drunk, never smoked dope, been in church your whole life, good hard worker, never stole, never lied, never cheated. God's got just as much of a big plan for you as he did for me. Do you know that even though you're one of one, you're original, and everybody's portrait don't look the same? You guys sing and you preach. I just preach. Chet, you pastor. I'm an evangelist. Tommy, you're the sound man. I'm the preacher. Hal, you're running the live stream. Tommy's running the sound. Brian prays under the stage. Amanda works the book table. My dad runs the platform and makes sure everything goes smooth. But Doug leads the singing. But Amy plays the piano. But you sing and play the guitar. But you're a drummer. You're a bass player. Well, you own a farm. Well, you own a farm. Well, you work over here. You work over there. See, our portraits ain't the same, but God cares just as much about your portrait as he did my portrait. And he's going to put just as much detail in your portrait as he does my portrait. Why? Because the ultimate goal is to lift him up and to bring glory to his name. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. So, you've given up on God. Maybe somebody's here that used to pastor and you got hurt. It wasn't your plan to be hurt. It wasn't your plan not to be where you thought you'd be the rest of your life. All God did was just change up the scenery a little bit on your canvas. Doesn't mean He's through with you. God has never thrown away a portrait He started. Y'all didn't get that? Y'all dead as four o'clock tonight. I said God has never thrown away a portrait that he started. Never. And God always finishes it. He doesn't start and then say, well, halfway through, you know what? I'm just going to throw that one to the side and I'll come back to it later. Or I'm just going to throw that one in the trash because it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to turn out. Or this or that. No, it may be meticulous and it may take a little while and it may be a little harder going at it than what you thought it'd be. But He is going to finish your portrait in His time, in His will, in His way. And the best thing you can do, honey, is just hang on that wall and let God keep on painting. And when God says, I think I'll add a little bird here, just say, okay, Lord, I'm yours. When he says, you know what, I think I'm going to add a little deer over here at the water. Okay, God, I'm all yours. Well, I think I'm going to add a little oak tree right here. Okay, God, I'm all yours. Roberta wasn't on my itinerary, but it was a little oak tree that God wanted to paint on my portrait. 
What if? What if? In God's divine plan. God's divine plan. And it was, because I'm here. The portrait that God started for me four years ago. His divine plan was to be in Roberta at this time because that was the biggest piece of the portrait he wanted to paint. Could Roberta, as small as it is, be the biggest piece to his portrait? It's always the things we don't think matters are the things that end up making the portrait what it is. My wife painted a picture of the Bighorn Mountains. Oh, it was gorgeous. I thought it was wonderful. She said, no, it ain't right yet. I thought, man, it can hang on the wall right now. It looks good. But then she got in there, and she painted two big old bull elk in the middle of a meadow feeding. And it was those two bull elk that made that portrait stand out among all the rest of them. And maybe in God's sovereignty, he looked down and said, on DR's portrait, I'm going to paint Roberta, Georgia. And it's going to make that painting what I want it to be. I don't know what God's going to do. I just know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. That painting's on the wall. And he's changing the brushes. And he's taking some of that oil and that water and all that stuff. And he's erasing a couple things. In our lives, God's erased a lot of things. There's people in my life that wasn't here when I started four years ago. I look at it like this. There's people in your life for a season, a reason. And there's some in your life for a lifetime. And so... At first, I thought, God, why is this person not here no more? He served his purpose. Now I'm going to erase that out of your life. And in place, I'm going to put what I want there permanently. And the people he's taken out, he's replaced with people that can serve his purpose and his will for his life through me. Does that make sense? So what are you going through? That you say, God's given up on me. No, he's just using a different brush. And it's only up to us to say, God, I trust you. I am your portrait. And you are the painter. In other terms, I'm the potter. Or I'm the clay and you're the potter. I'm just the clay on the potter's wheel. When you're molding that clay, there's a piece falls off. You've got to pick it up and pack it back on. Reshape it. Then another piece falls off. There's a whole lot of broken pieces that you think God's done with you, but He's not. He's just reshaping some things. He's re- hey, Jeff, He's reforming some things. He's knocking some of the hard edges off. And He's taking some fresh clay and He's packing it in there. And yes, it hurts a little bit. There's some trying times in my life where I've hurt a whole lot. But it's all worked out for my good. And most of all, His glory. You know, when I got victory over all this, whenever I learned to do this, thank you, Lord, for everything. God, you said in everything to give thanks. God, I don't understand why they walked out on me, but God, thank you. God, I don't understand why you allowed our babies to to die, but God, thank you. God, I don't understand why you allowed me to have a brain parasite and about leave this world. But God, thank you. God, I don't understand why all the lies and rumors and all the garbage that's been told on our family has been done. But God, thank you. God, I don't understand why you sent me to Roberta. But God, thank you. God, I don't understand what your plan is, but I'm thanking you in advance because you are worthy. Do you know some of the best treasures you'll ever find in your Christian walk is in dark places. I'm not done preaching. Just bear with me. I got something else I need to say. Isaiah. Isaiah, Isaiah, Isaiah. I hope I can find it. I want to read this verse to you. Isaiah. Where's it at? Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Isaiah. 
I'll find it. Here we go. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, 3. Thank you, Lord. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Some of the best kept secrets of God you can be revealed to in your darkest places in your life. Do you know that darkness is a thing? It's the absence of light. You never hear anybody say, it came in at the speed of darkness. It came in at the speed of light. Because you can measure light. Measure is quantifiable. Light can be felt. It can be touched. It can be measured. You measure light in wattage. You measure sound in decibels. But you don't measure darkness. There's a lot of Christians that are living in darkness that think God has done with them. But it's in those darkness He can reveal His treasures. See, we're living in a world of this Facebook, Twitter, Instagram society, this self-egotistical, self-absorbed society where everybody wants to be in the spotlight. But what you don't understand, God does His greatest work in the dark. Some of you don't recognize it. But God wants to do His greatest work in your life in the dark. Listen to this. Everybody knows these 35 millimeter cameras they used to have. And big old things. Put the film in it. Go take your pictures. But you didn't get the picture right then, did you? You didn't get the picture and start looking at it and showing all your buddies. It went into a little plastic container. And then it went into a dark room so it could develop. And if it was exposed to light too quick, it never developed. Some of you are in a dark place because God ordains you being there. And you're trying to get out of it. But if you'll realize that God's trying to develop you in the dark, He'll show you His purpose for your life. That's good preaching. Now to all you farmers, here's a good one. When you get ready to plant seed, you don't go get a bag of seed from the co-op, take it and put it in a bag and sit it on the shelf and three months later you got a whole bunch of corn. It can sit on that shelf for 750 generations and it's still going to be a bag of seed. What do you got to do with that seed? You got to dig some dirt back. You got to put that seed in the dark and you got to cover it up. Because the only way that seed's going to produce fruit, it's got to go in the dark first. Now see, to some people you say, well, you're burying that seed. There's a difference between planting and burying. When you bury something, you cover it up, and you have no plans of it ever coming out. But when God plants something in the dark, He's planting it there to grow you. So you can produce, God, I feel the Holy Ghost on this stage. He plants you so he can grow you so you can produce fruit for him. And some of you are cussing the darkness in your life. Quit fussing and cussing over it and say, God, develop me in the dark place. When that seed goes in the ground, that ain't what it's always gonna be. Throw that dirt over it. It sits there. Nothing's happening. And all of a sudden, a little sprout comes up. Then it gets a little bigger. And it gets a little bigger. And guess what happens? Here comes a big thunderstorm. Lays it over just a little bit. Suffers through a little bit of weather. But it still keeps on standing. Then all of a sudden, one of those little ears start popping out. Now there's some fruit. Now here comes another ear. 
And all of a sudden, what started as a seed in a dark place, all by yourself. Thank you, Lord. What you don't understand, when God plants you in the dark, you're going to be all by yourself with everybody else gone, but God's going to still be there with you because he's going to water that seed. It may be lonely for a little bit. It may be dark for a little bit. It may go on for several years, but you've got to understand, God's trying to develop you in the dark, and what God started when he planted that seed in the dark, bless God, he's going to finish it when it comes up on the ground and produces fruit for his glory. Somebody say amen. God's going to finish what he started. This is good. I read this today. Everybody knows who Helen Keller is. Once there was three boys that came to Helen Keller. Read the story today. It kind of caught me. They said to her, said, hey, Helen, it must be awfully terrible what you're going through being blind. We can't imagine what it's like not to have our sight. We feel so sorry for you. Helen Keller's response was this. It ain't so bad to be blind. It's better to be blind than to have sight with no vision. You see, she was in the dark, but she had vision. See, some of you in your dark place and you think nobody's around, you can't see in front of you, you can't see behind you, you can't see on either side of you, but if you'll just tap into the vision on the inside of your heart that the Holy Ghost birthed inside of you, you don't need your physical eyes because my physical eyes are going to discourage me, they're going to depress me, and they'll let me, hey, if I let them, they'll destroy me, but if I tap into that insight that comes on the inside of my heart, that vision that God birthed inside of me, I can go through the darkest storms, I can go through the toughest times and I can know that if God starts it he's going to finish it what are some of the, these things you can find when it's dark and find the realness of his presence the revelation of his plan the release from your persecutors and the ability to rejoice over that that once made you weep. Psalms 119 says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statues. The greatest day of my life was when I learned to thank God for my affliction. The most liberty I ever had was when I learned to praise God for my affliction. The freedom and the peace and the joy and the comfort that came knowing that it's all part of God's plan. And I may be broken and battered and hurt, but I'm just a portrait on God's easel. And He's painting my portrait. And the whole purpose is one day to walk through the pearly gates and to hear Him say these words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Heavenly Father, I preach what you told me to preach. Thank you for liberty tonight. Thank you, Father Lord, for the Word of God. Thank you for opening it up to me, fresh and anew today. Father, I don't know what people are going through tonight, but you do. I pray tonight they'd be encouraged to know that you're not finished with them yet. God, have your will and way. In Jesus' name, I know there's hurting people all over this place. I ain't going to beg you to come. I don't think I need to. Just come on. Come on. You say, there's something in my life. I feel like God's done with me, or I don't understand why this is taking place. Would you come? That's right. They're coming all over the tent. Come on. Don't be shy. Your life ain't perfect. If it is perfect in your eyes, you're fixing to go through a storm. You're either going into a storm, in a storm, or coming out of one. Why don't you get in this altar with your family? Say, God, help us to always thank you for everything, good or bad. Who'll be the first daddy to get up and grab your kids and wife and get in this altar? And say, God, would you finish what you started in our lives? Would you finish the portrait that you started in our lives? Come on. Come on. Grab them kids. Come on.
There you go. Wonderful. While Doug sings, you mind the Lord. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. This is wonderful. Mind the Lord. tonight church wounded and weak 